sleepy country village in the heart of Dorset, halfway between Paul and Dorchester. Life for most people here is probably very comfortable, but if we go back in time, less than 200 years ago, life for the working man would have been very different. For a farm labourer on subsistent wages, life was tough. In fact, it was more than tough. It was a daily fight for survival. But their story and their legacy will live on, not just here in Tollpuddle, but across England and the rest of the world. Ironically, in this period, Britain was at the height of its success as an empire. And yet, in spite of this, or maybe because of it, at least 45% of the population struggled in abject poverty. Here in Tollpuddle, it was no exception, with wages being on average less than 10 shillings a week for a farm labourer. The basic cost of living was over 13 shillings a week. Toiling in their labour and their efforts, this meant that they were at a deficit at the end of every week. Subsidising their wages through grazing chickens or pigs or growing vegetables on common land was no longer an option. Due to the Enclosures Acts, most of the common land was now in private ownership. So unless the rest of the family could find work, life was very grim. George Lovelace, James Lovelace, Thomas and John Stanfield, James Brine and James Hammett came together and decided to form a trade union of agricultural workers. To these men, this decision was a matter of life or death. Our Tollpuddle labourers worked and toiled in these very fields. The days were long and hard, between 10 and 12 hours. There was no sick pay, holiday pay, health and safety or job security and very little help from the parishes. By the age of 50, invariably, the men would be suffering from a range of illnesses brought on by harsh working conditions, poverty and poor housing. Some nights, there would be no food on the table. When darkness fell, you couldn't afford a candle. Foraging for wood wasn't possible due to the Enclosures Acts. If you had no money, you couldn't buy coal. Labourers worked hard, 12 hours a day, and when they came home, their reward was to sit there cold, hungry, and in the dark. Slavery had been abolished in the British territories a year earlier, yet here, in the heartland of the empire, a very real form of slavery still existed. To George Lovelace, this was unacceptable. What choice did the men of Tollpuddle have? Their backs were against the wall. Even their children and their wives were open to the exploitation of greedy landowners and employment laws that were set to benefit the ruling classes. So in 1833, they met under this very tree and actively established a union, a friendly society that would bind them together in support to work against further cuts to their wages and to fight for a better standard of living. Our main protagonist, George Lovelace, was a lay preacher and an admired and respected man. Despite being born into poverty, he was self-educated, articulate and wrote eloquently. He supported his wife, Elizabeth, and three children and was the driving force behind the protest for a fair living wage. In 1834, he was 37 years old. The story of the Tolpado Martyrs is almost as much about the events leading up to 1834 as it is about the events of 1834 itself. It was undoubtedly what we might call a revolutionary period. We had had the French Revolution, the American War of Independence, but we also had 
all sorts of revolutionary ideas, the writings of Thomas Paine, for example. And it was in this context that we also had the economic issues that followed the Napoleonic War. So after the Napoleonic War, the soldiers, the demobilized soldiers, came back to Britain. And unlike today, where kind of the army is like a career, a paid career, and you have a mortgage and a house somewhere, soldiers would maybe be beforehand living in just rooms above pubs in all sorts of places. They'd be mobilized, go off and fight a war, and would probably just be left where they were. Some of them would even settle there or just make their own way back and might end up in an entirely different part of the country. So this mass of young men actually affected the rural wages, you know, not unlike some of the questions we hear today about population mobility and the impact on people's wages today. This is the cottage where our toll puddle labourers met to plan their strategy. This was not an offence at the time and it was not illegal to set up a union. What was brought into question was their membership rituals because they'd sworn an oath in front of a picture of a skeleton. This could be seen as an offence under the Mutinies Act. However, this was a dubious assertion, as the Mutinies Act was meant for the armed services, not the civilian population. It was one of their own farm labourers, an Edward Legg, who portrayed them to the authorities shortly after their first meeting. Further evidence came from a Mrs Waitham, whose husband had been commissioned by James Lovelace to paint the picture of the skeleton. Landowners were quick to jump on the formation of any unions, and they gratefully accepted this opportunity. Squire Frampton was the primary landowner, and an iniquitous gentleman born in 1769 to a wealthy, landed gentry family near Morton. He was a believer in king and country, and maintaining the status quo of master and worker. He was heavily invested in the Enclosures Act that contributed to his vast acreages of land. Well connected politically right the way up to the Home Secretary, Lord Melbourne. In league with his sons James and Henry, his stepbrother Charles Wollaston, William Ponsonby MP and several other magistrates that were also landowning squires. When the six labourers were brought to trial here in Dorchester at Shire Hall, these were the men who sat on the jury, and it was presided over by Judge Baron Williams. The influence of the Home Secretary, Lord Melbourne, was clear, as was also the opinions of the landed gentry. Organised labour was contrary to the laws of nature. This is the very cell where our six toll puddle labourers were kept here at Shire Hall. Conditions in this cell would have been smoky and uncomfortable. In 1834, they spent three nights here while they awaited their fate. George Lovelace spoke eloquently at the trial. Quoting Milton, he said, give me the liberty to think to speak, to argue freely according to conscience above all other liberties. We have injured no man's reputation, character, persons or property. We are united to preserve ourselves, our wives, our children against utter degradation and starvation. George Lovelace's words fell on deaf ears. The fate of our six toll labourers had been decided before the trial even started. Therefore, the outcome of the trial was no surprise, and the sentencing was harsh and severe. Judge Baron Williams remarked, This is an example and a warning to others. The crime could have carried a seven-day punishment, but Judge Baron Williams added seven years to this 
a trip to an Australian penal colony on a disease-ridden overcrowded boat with hard labour thrown into boot. The severity of the sentence carried a very clear message. Pushing back against those in power came at a very steep price. His words to George Lovelace's wife were damning. There will be no parish relief for your family, nor will you be able to visit your husband. You shall suffer want. You shall have no mercy. After the trial, our six labourers were brought back to this cell for a short period of time, where they would have been able to contemplate their fate, sent to a foreign land where they could die of disease, punishment, or simply be worked to death. What Frampton and the others did not expect was the huge repercussions of their actions. A petition for their release garnered over 800,000 signatures. The estimated population of the country at the time was just over 15 million, which was 5% of the inhabitants of Great Britain, equivalent to 3 million signatures today. The response to the sentencing of the six Tolpuddle labourers by the general public was unheard of. This was 1835. There was no social media, television or radio. Communication of events was by print, via newspapers or leaflets, or just simply word of mouth. A month after the trial, 35 unions marched in solidarity in London on behalf of the Tollpuddle Martyrs. And an unprecedented 800,000 signature petition was handed to Lord Melbourne. He refused to accept it, but the fires of reform had been lit. One really significant part of the story is the petition for the free pardon and return to Britain of the martyrs. And this was actually part of a wider campaign because the trial itself had actually drawn far more publicity than those that brought the charges had ever expected that it would. Now, this was partly a factor of Lovelace himself being a very articulate orator. And as a Methodist lay preacher, it meant that in the dock, he was not intimidated as the architecture of the place was intended. He actually knew how to handle an audience. But also, the growth in literacy of the population meant people were reading newspapers. And Shire Hall in Dorchester, where the trial was held, was one of the first assize courts to actually have a dedicated press bench. So news was spread. And the London Dorchester Committee was formed. And the fledgling trade union movement also knew that this would be a test case. So they actually organized organized events to support the martyrs, which culminated in April 1834 in a mass march in London. Picking up the fight was Thomas Wakeley MP, who campaigned tirelessly on the Tollpuddles martyrs' behalf in Parliament. And he used a very clever argument. He pointed out that the Orange Lodges, who were pro-British Irish Protestants, had also sworn a secret oath. And therefore, this must be just as illegal. This was potentially embarrassing for the Crown because the King's own brother was head of the Orange Lodges. Lord Russell had been appointed as Home Secretary and he was a reformist, replacing Lord Melbourne. Couple this with continuing public pressure and the objection to the Toll Puddles Martyrs release started to crumble. So in 1836, a very reluctant William IV pardoned the six Toll Puddle Martyrs. However, due to bureaucracy, it wasn't until 1837 that the Toll Puddle Martyrs started to return home from the penal colonies in Australia. The first to return was George Lovelace, and the others followed shortly afterwards. However, it wasn't until 1839, until the last martyr returned home, James Hammett. And he is the only Tollpuddle martyr that remained living here in the village. 
and he was buried in the local graveyard here. And you can find his grave today. On returning home, the martyr's passion to improve the lives of working people had not wavered. They joined the Charis movement, which openly supported a better political system to make it more democratic. George Loveless wrote a book, The Victims of Whiggery, which was influential in fighting against immoral employment practices. A battle had been won, but the war continued for better working rights for people. Five of our Tolpuddle martyrs left the country and resettled in Ontario, Canada, because of continued antagonism here by the landed gentry. It's without question that unions became stronger because of these men's actions. The resolve they showed in standing up for the very basics of humanity is a powerful reminder of the influence of action and the strength of the convictions of men. Their story is a fundamental part of improving our society, preserving equality and promoting democracy. These men and women went through unbelievable hardships so that future generations could live in a freer and more secure society.